All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining today. I know it's um, a little different as we start to get back into clinical um, activities, so appreciate it. Um, I just thought I'd bring up a kind of different topic. We've co covered a lot of basics and a lot of different stuff in this consortium, so I thought I'd um, bring this up as this is sort of a kind of the kind of thing that's in the news a lot and just more even in our um, our meetings, both in Academy and even AF in AFPRS. Um, and just by way of background, I did my fellowship in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery with Dr. Spiegel. So I worked with a lot of um, mostly facial feminization for trans women. Um, and then I'm doing some of that here, but because of that referral pattern from our transform clinic, um, I do see a fair number of transgender patients um, just for um, ENT reasons. Um, and I just think it's worthwhile um, to talk about a few um, things in terms of dealing with those patients in clinic, as well as, um, uh, and then a little bit of facial feminization at the end. So we'll just go over some basics um, about transgender uh, patients um, and in clinic, and then um, I kind of do end the presentation with um, some thoughts on facial feminization. Um, please feel free to ask any questions um, in the chat or Q&A. Um, we can kind of answer them as we go along. Um, I know this is kind of hard to be interactive and that's more my style, so I'll try to um, keep it as much that way as we can. Um, I'm sorry, I am on call, so I keep looking at my phone. Um, all right, and I, I am in no way an expert. I don't uh, claim to be, and I've you know, tried to talk to people, and I know several people who work with a lot of these patients who are more better experts than I am, um, but I just want to kind of help you all um, in, in kind of treating these patients with dignity in the clinic. Um, uh, one thing I will say is I think your all's generation has been, had a lot more exposure and a lot more um, and understanding. So it may be sort of a different thing for you all than um, some older folks who may not have seen as many of these patients um, be out basically. All right. So just some kind of brief um, definitions. Um, in general, someone's transgender, um, that means they have a sense of personal identity um, and gender that does not correspond with their birth sex. And in general, we talk about gender, we're really talking about a social construct. So that's just something that about is about more um, identity and society. And then we talk about, uh, you may hear a lot of different terms and when I was making this presentation, I picked gender non-binary because that's one that comes a lot. Like Sam Smith has now come out as that way. So neither, um, basically it's someone who identifies neither as man or woman or both or some sort of combination. Um, and that is something that I did not know about. And I had known about transgender people a little bit before my fellowship and that came up a little bit. And I didn't, I honestly felt um, badly when I look back about how I address that because I just didn't understand it. I didn't ask questions and I didn't really, I was just kind of kept using the wrong pronouns and forcing my way through an interaction. And so I think it's just important to be aware of these things. Some other words you may hear like gender non-conforming, gender queer, all these things, um, some are kind of considered more correct and, and not, I um, mean, you know, there's a lot of letters after LGBT GBT and um, there's a lot of different identities that people have. So just being aware of them, you don't have to be an expert in any way, but just being aware and um, being respectful is really the key. Um, so prevalence, obviously, it's not a very common um, part of our population, and numbers are sort of, um, they vary, but it's um, very low, less than 1%. Um, sometimes you'll hear, you know, the numbers are low, partly because um, I think that they're just not, it's not very common. Um, but it's, they're also a little bit underestimated because a lot of people either aren't out or don't, um, say so on, on surveys or whatnot. Um, it is interesting that now younger individuals, the number is closer um, to 1%, and that may be um, closer to the more correct number as more people feel comfortable coming out, but it's not necessarily like our, the society is, is super um, um, comfortable with it overall. So um, I don't think that we would see this number go much beyond this, but it is just something to keep in mind. As you sort of notice, you see more people um, out and about, it is because, partly because they're more comfortable being out, not that their numbers it's that are increasing. Um, 
So the most important thing that you can do as a provider, you just remember, you know, first you're a human and then you're a doctor. And the first, you know, the most important thing you can do is just to treat someone with dignity and make sure that they feel safe. Um, so important thing is names and pronouns can get very confusing. You may see somebody come in and their legal name and gender is one thing and you walk in the room or your um, medical assistant or somebody alerts you um, that something's sort of up. And it may be that their legal name hasn't been changed yet. And it's actually a, um, quite a difficult process. You have to get a lawyer and things to change um, your legal name in this setting and even the gender on your license, et cetera. So they may not have done that yet, or it may there may be some barriers to that. So that you, that's why you may see that. Um, and then there's a preferred name. So it's always useful to ask them what their preferred name is. Um, and pronouns is becoming really common. You'll see on Twitter or whatever, anybody, um, both cis and transgender people are putting what their preferred pronouns are. And that's the point is to make people who are um, either transgender or some sort of um, um, other component um, feel more comfortable in saying what their pronouns are. So it's, it's perfectly um, appropriate um, if they don't already tell you what they are to ask what their pronouns are. And a nice thing, if you can, if it's some, a patient you're gonna see multiple times, is to actually mark that in the chart, both their preferred name and their pronouns. And that's something nice that we have here that um, we can put in the chart and then any provider they see in our institution can see that. And so being alerted to that and then use and then trying really hard to use those pronouns is important. One thing we'll talk about a little bit later is the pronouns are tough. You even if and I talk to this talk to my patients about this, even if you're at the meat counter and someone just kind of looks up glance and says, Oh, hi, sir, you know, they're kind of they may be looking at certain cues that are nonverbal in your face or in your stature. And they're not meaning to misgender you, even if you're dressed a certain way. And um, that's really common. I've done it myself. You know, in my fellowship, we dealt mostly with trans women, some trans men, but mostly trans women. And so I just got used to saying she, her. That's just what I did. And then um, I had a patient who's a trans man here for an ENT reason, and I just kept saying she had very soft feminine features, had been on testosterone, and I, you know, dressed as a man, et cetera. But I just, oh my gosh, I couldn't stop. And I just, it's really, it's, I, you know, I felt very badly, and I apologize, but it's something that you have to note that. Um, I remind patients that sometimes people out in the community are not intending to mis, uh, misgender them. Um, and sometimes it's just something that is sort of essentially subconscious. Um, so in your clinic, you especially want to think about um, your patient's safety. So in general, you just want to have an environment that um, is welcoming. Um, and, and you don't have to, you know, if you want to be the kind of clinic that is like a trans health clinic, then you want to, you would want to have um, there are certain cues, kind of like rainbow flag, those kinds of things that you can have around, or, you know, those pins. And, and you know, you don't, but you also don't have to have that. Um, in terms of staff, if you are going to see some of these patients, or if you do see one, it's important to remind them about these things in terms of name and pronouns and just being respectful. It doesn't mean you have to subscribe to any sort of ideology. It just means you're being respectful of this person and how they um, choose to live in the world. Um, and one key that um, comes up quite a lot, actually, um, even after my fellowship is, um, and I'll come back up a, a little bit later, um, from the um, therapy community is don't be a voyeur. So you may be a supporter or not, and, and you just may want to know more about their lives. And it's very important in any interaction to learn a little bit more about your patient. Um, but you don't want to just be interested for entertainment. You want to ask appropriate questions. And you can learn from them, and I think that's useful, but you have to be really careful not to just sort of, again, be like uh, entertained. Um, then mental health is really important, and especially as providers, we always have to think about this. You think about it in terms of, say, you're seeing a trauma patient and you are concerned about maybe domestic violence, and it's very important for you to ask if they're still safe at home. The same kind of mentality about mental health being an all an entire uh, part of our profession uh, is very key here. So there's much higher rates of depression, anxiety, both non-suicidal self-injury and suicidal ideation. And they're up to two to, and again, in the literature, which may be underreported, up to two to four times the normal rate. Um, and some of these statistics are just really striking. Up to 41% of transgender adults may attempt suicide. And those um, questioning who are unsure, you know, there's a lot of, um, concern and self-loathing that goes on with that, and they have a 300% greater chance of attempting suicide. Um, and many don't access care for that. So if you're getting hints or you're not sure, uh, it's 
always um, important to, to ask the questions and make sure that they are safe um, and have some resources for them. And, and you know, outside of their own sort of um, personal mental health, um, they also suffer a lot of external harassment. So there's um, harassment and violence, the homicide rate is quite high. Um, there's multiple forms of discrimination and even um, rates of uh, um, infectious disease such as HIV. So some protective factors um, that you can always ask about or, or get a sense of if someone comes with them, for example, are positive relationships with caring peers or friend networks. Um, there's actually, and these don't have to be in person, a lot of um, these networks actually exist um, online on Reddit and subreddit groups and things. So a lot of patients, if they're not, they don't know about those things, you know, you can tell them that there are ways to connect with people online because it is such a low uh, percentage in the um, population. Um, supportive and accepting family members are really helpful and protective, feeling safe, and then having a healthy view of one's own sexual orientation, gender identity. And obviously with any of anybody think about an adolescent, having a healthy view of oneself is something that takes a long time, even if you're uh, cisgendered. Um, and then access to culturally appropriate mental health services, particularly if you're in a rural area outside of the big city, um, it's important to um, be aware that, that um, if patients don't have access to that kind of thing, you can help them with that. So this is just a couple of slides um, just for background um, about assessment for gender dysphoria. And this is really in the um, kind of therapy realm. Um, so in general, um, by the time, you know, I've seen a patient for facial feminization, they've been on hormones for about a year. They, you know, they're pretty set on what they want to do. Um, so I kind of see a different, uh, kind of more mature view of this. But you may see patients just in your clinic for ENT issues for a number of different things. So in general, provider's role is to make reasonably sure that gender dysphoria is not better accounted for um, for secondary and other diagnoses. And so someone else is really um, taking that role. And if you are if you find a patient who's questioning, guiding them to finding an appropriate therapist is really important. And this is just kind of some background on um, what those people do. Um, and then psychotherapy actually is not a requirement for hormones or surgery, but they do just want to uh, often, uh, is recommended to have letters of assessment. Um, the SOC is actually from the WPATH, which we'll go over, um, is um, standard of care and does not re recommend a mini minimal um, number of sessions or anything. It's just a, an assessment from a provider. Um, so some terminology you may come across, some patients feel really comfortable and they're sort of using all these um, all kind of jargon and letters and one that you may come across especially um, in facial surgery is um, kind of you've heard about gender reassignment surgery so that's an older term but a lot of people still use the word the letters grs so to kind of be more accepting sometimes people will use things like gender confirmation surgery and then it became oh it's easier to people still say grs so gender reconfirmation and then it you can always get better words and that's why there's too many words um, so really now i believe it's more gender affirming surgery and sometimes you may see gender reaffirming surgery again just to make it um, fit those letters because um, that's really just um, common um, and this can refer in general you know when you think about gender reassignment you think about that referring to what people call bottom surgery um, that is something that is essentially irreversible so that is where it's much more important to have a lot of support hormone therapy um, and uh, multiple assessments top surgery whether it's um, breast implants or mastectomy um, is sort of again a little bit more in the reversible realm but still a, a, a big undertaking um, and sometimes that can be considered in this uh, it's hard to tell sometimes um, insurance um, programs are sort of vague and so they may say that they cover this and it's unclear if that's bottom and top and then really always unclear if that includes facial feminization or facial surgery. Um, this is just again um, not to go through it in detail but just um, some requirements for top surgery. Um, they recommend hormone therapy for at least 12 months before. Um, you know age of majority is is questionable. Some people will do surgery on um, patients who are like, you know, 16, 18, really not um, younger than that. Um, and then general surgery, again, it's a little bit more, um, more stringent because it is um, essentially reversible. Um, and this is, a, you know, some guidelines about gender affirming therapy. And again, the main thing is you're just in bold is avoiding pathologizing overemphasis or voyeurism interactions with your clients. You also talk to them, learn about them. Uh, but just because this is your first transgender patient you're meeting doesn't mean that you need to, you know, kind of overemphasize that. You're, they're there for a reason uh, related to head and neck and you want to still focus on that. 
and hear them. So letters in general for hormone therapy, um, sometimes they recommend a letter and then that's kind of the first line. And then uh, in general, one letter for top surgeries and two for bottom surgeries. And there's no real requirements for, for facial surgery. And again, because that's, most of those things are essentially um, reversible or, if, you know, there's feminine um, faces on cis men, masculine faces on cis women. So that's why it's, it's less, um, less of a, a kind of reverse irreversible issue um, and these are letters from um, like uh, letters of evaluation not of having done therapy um, from um, a therapist so some resources um, WPATH is really um, a good one um, they have um, worldwide meetings which I guess I don't know what's gonna happen with those um, that's a really good resource um, for information if you're just curious um, there's community groups and again this also uh, include community groups online suicide prevention hotlines I think that's something again all these things are easily googleable googleable but in any of your patients you need to be sort of ready to give them um, information or um, if you're concerned um, again internet community support groups and then PFLAG pride transparent and fairness are all different groups that have great websites um, if you need if you would like to learn more if you have a family member a community member or a patient um, that may need more resources um, okay so now we'll dive into a little bit more um, surgery so um, I focus on facial feminization I didn't really talk about much in terms of hormones and things but in generally for trans men testosterone is strong it does a lot. Um, and so for the most part, kind of facial masculinization um, doesn't really exist. In some patients, you can use um, you know, filler or even implants to kind of strengthen a jaw, but for the most part, with hair growth, um, deepening the voice and things, um, patients don't really come looking for surgical intervention. So it's worthwhile knowing and, and you know, if, if that ever comes up. Feminization is another thing. So even if patients are on hormones early, um, meaning even in adolescence, and there's even hormones for kind of like delaying puberty with if um, adolescents are questioning, there's still issues of um, bony growth and things that, you know, that don't, uh, hormones don't really affect. Um, that's where facial feminization surgery comes into play. The, the hormones can affect um, breast growth and development, um, decrease male pattern baldness, or really eliminate it, and, and change kind of uh, skin quality, but there's still a lot um, of procedures that you can offer patients. And particularly patients who have gone through, you know, we kind of, I see sort of, you see sort of like a bimodal. Some patients come in, present really young, and have been on hormones early, and they look pretty good. And then you have some patients who have kind of lived their whole life in the closet, and come and they're like maybe 70, um, and they're just kind of finally ready to um, live their true selves. So, um, and they, they tend to need, um, they may need more because of that. So I'm going to go over just a few different things, um, some sort of non-surgical things just to know about, um, cause you may be the first person that someone's seeing, they may ask you questions and you may be able to direct them. I think a lot of times these patients, um, read stuff online and um, kind of get directed into certain avenues and there's no kind of quarterback for them. And so as much as I can, I try to help be that um, ideally their um, clinic wherever they get their hormones um, can help be that as well but it, you know sometimes it may be you um, so in general with for hair removal um, a lot of the um, a lot of y'all will know these things already just from commercials and, and experience yourself so there's depilation it's the simplest so mechanical depilation is sh you know shaving just cutting the hair off right at the skin surface uh, or chemical which is essentially doing the same thing um, but dissolving that hair with things like nair. Um, epilation, which means removing the hair kind of ideally from the root but, or whatever will come. And so that can be waxing. Um, threading is similar without having to have like a material on top um, or an epilator, which is an evil um, mechanical device that just kind of rips hairs out. Um, and then of course we know about uh, lasers. I've probably learned a lot about that and have uh, test questions on lasers and that's related to um, color. And then electrolysis. So it's interesting about electrolysis is you know, as a woman in the world, I don't know that much about electrolysis, but in the trans community, electrolysis is really common. So it's important to know about it. So in terms of hair removal, the reason we talk about it, we, we all know that laser is, is probably the best for that, but for whatever reason, that's kind of um, in the community. So laser is important to note both skin and hair color because laser is light and so color is really important. So there's kind of two options in general um, for um, fair skin, folks, uh, Alexandrite is, is better. And then for um, people with more like my skin tone, like an ND YAG laser is safer. 
This requires multiple treatments. It's not permanent. It's almost more of a maintenance, but over time can reduce um, um, appearance of hair and make it go from kind of a coarse quality to finer. And coarser, darker hair on fair skin is the easiest um, to get rid of. Kind of fine hairs or certainly white hairs are, are very difficult or impossible. And electrolysis, I think the reason that it is so popular in the community is because um, it's essentially permanent. It is multiple treatments. It's very tedious. It's literally going to each um, hair and zapping it with an electric current. Um, and the problem with that is you get a lot of skin scarring and pockmarks that tend to be very obvious that you've had it. Um, but it, it can be used on light color hairs. So um, this is, I think, an interesting example. This is a, um, I just got this from Google Images. So it's an example of a clinic with a very good outcome um, of electrolysis on uh, patient's facial hair, coarse facial hair. Um, but what you can see is this is a, an advertised outcome, but you see these kind of pock marks, and that's um, kind of indicative of having had electrolysis. And you'll see, uh, I've seen much worse than this, and it's um, that kind of coarse squint quality is also not um, ideal for feminizing face. Um, and then hair restoration. This is actually a topic um, that comes up on thin service and boards, so I thought I'd just cover it, um, but it's important to know in this um, uh, a group of patients. So you know, medical therapies, all we really have um, roughly are uh, minoxidil or Rogaine, and that's a topical treatment. I think that's generally considered to be best on the vertex of the scalp. And then finasteride um, or Propecia, which is an angiogen uh, blocker. And that can be used um, in the trans women population, and that's a, an oral, uh, which can help both, I think, vertex and um, the front hairline. That being said, um, being on estrogen, um, prevents the progression of male pattern baldness. It doesn't grow hair back, but it at least prevents that progression. So when you think about surgical incisions and things, it's um, nice to be able to counsel patients on. And then surgical, we know about, the main thing is that follicular unit transplantation. And again, I'm, I'm no expert on this. Um, and then, uh, and that kind of was related to those naturally occurring units of one to four hairs. Um, and then there's obviously bigger surgical things like scalp advancement or reductions. Um, uh, and axial flap transfers. So you always have to know your Norwood classification and that's sort of a um, male pattern balding. And not everybody will go through all of these um, phases, but this is almost always on the test. So this is just um, pictures of follicular unit transplantation. Um, it can be taken from a strip method from the back or there's, uh, I don't have a photo of it here, um, but there's other uh, machines or devices that take it from kind of a whole section in the back of, again, that stable hair. Um, that would leaving less of a scar. And then you kind of um, place the grafts. And you have to be really careful with the front hairline because um, the front hairline is not uniform. There's hairs growing in different directions. Um, and if you've done any pretracheal incisions, you'll know that. Um, and there's kind of finer wispy hairs um, that are there as well. So the risks, the main one, I mean, risks are really poor cosmetic um, results, kind of looking like hair plugs down at the bottom. And that's usually with a, a kind of a previous to follicular unit transplantation. Um, so you may see that in some of your patients. Um, it really sucks if they come to you after they've had a hair transplant and then you're gonna do some sort of um, coronal or pretracheal approach because you end up cutting those out and it's, it's just a loss of um, time and money for them. Um, so that's why it's really nice to have a, a quarterback who can talk to them about when hair restoration is, is useful and, um, and timing of other procedures. Uh, telogen effluvium on the test slot, shock loss of three months. Uh, it's always important to counsel patients about. Um, people obviously really freak out about that. And you, get, you can get these you know, epidural cysts and grown hairs, um, decreased sensation, scarring, and then graft direction is really important. I think I have a picture about that. Um, so some people um, get really good at this, kind of this hairline with grafting. And the thing about these, each of these um, grafts, you have to decide the direction of the hair. And you really don't want to do it prior to doing like a forehead procedure, which we'll talk about. Um, and this, again, this is something just from the internet. Um, and it's a really good outcome. But you can see, um, you have to choose, this is the direction kind of of a ponytail. And so they're not going to have as much um, movement. But you can also, you can tell exactly where it was done. Um, so that can just be, it's just really tough. It just, it's just this mode of um, addressing the hairline can be, can be really um, tough to get just right. Um, and so patients should be aware of that when they're deciding what they wanna do and it's appropriate for them. Um, and so you'll find a lot of these patients will, will wear hair pieces and that's actually what they prefer. Um, so then scalp advancement is something we use um, quite a lot in, um, 
in these patients. And so discussing with the surgeon kind of the entire plan of that quarterback prior to beginning um, is really important. So that way you can actually, you know, we talk about like an M-shaped hairline in men versus um, uh, what women have more for the U-shaped uh, without those bitemporal recessions. And so closing those off um, as well as advancing, uh, lowering the hairline a bit. Because um, this, you know, this picture here is really sort of a Norwood too, is a really common, um, even in younger patients to have. So even correcting that um, is important to people, especially if they wanna wear their hair and ponytails. Um, and of course, injectables, and this may be something that you're seeing patients for. Um, we have neurotoxins like Botox or fillers, you know, Juvederm or um, Restylane, et cetera. Um, and those can be important, um, both in maintenance as well as in kind of uh, in the initial visits. Um, you know, in general, I have to counsel patients about their temporary, they require maintenance, they are reversible, and they can be done um, really at any time pre or post surgery. Obviously, with small caveats about not working after surgery. So, in general, we talk about facial feminization. Um, we think about multiple procedures, and we think about them being um, concurrent or staged. And you can even kind of really think of them almost like an a la carte menu, and that's how patients do. You know, some patients, you may see them, and they would do really well with all of them, but it's very important not to just throw that information at their face. You should um, really figure out where the dysphoria comes from. Some patients just look like a man in a dress, but they are not dysphoric and then they don't need anything. That's what's really important. If they are comfortable and they are not having problems, they don't want it, don't, don't tell them, don't point out what's, what's masculine, they know, but they're not bothered by it. Some patients look amazing, they look great. You wouldn't have even guessed, and you've seen a lot of these patients, you look at faces all day long and you wouldn't have guessed. Um, and then they're just really, really bothered by something. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, the Adam's apple or something. They just feel like, oh, if they extend their neck or whatever, it just, it's something that causes them dysphoria, then that's something you can talk to them about. And you can, you can also still talk them out of surgery. I think that's completely reasonable. Um, but it's really important to listen to what they are interested in, what will bring, make them feel more comfortable. Um, and again, you know, there's, you know, if you look at any sort of body dysmorphic questionnaire, Every trans person will like seem you know positive in that way. So those are really not useful in this population. It can be, so it can be very tough um, to weed um, those kinds of patients out. So you have to be really careful. So this is kind of an example of a patient who had a lot of procedures. Um, I kind of like to think about uh, facial analysis from top to bottom. So we kind of start off. Um, with the hairline, you can kind of see um, this, um, these bitemporal recessions, this kind of square hairline from the front, and then uh, again, sort of that M shape, um, if you kind of imagine the other side. Um, you can see um, this kind of glabellar uh, frontal bony bossing, really kind of obvious more on a profile view. And um, eyebrows are a little bit low, a little bit down slanting. Um, and then um, the nose is not too bad, um, but a little bit, you know, a little bit masculine. No dorsal hump, but um, pretty um, kind of 90 degree nasolabial angle. Um, we'll talk more about this later, but, um, you know, we talk about high cheekbones, really more of like a malar prominence, not as much of kind of a submalar um, fullness. Um, long upper lip, reasonable um, red lip really, and then a little bit of a square jaw, not too bad, and then a little bit of a um, kind of square chin as well. And then on the lateral view, you can get a better look um, at that Adam's apple or prominent um, thyroid cartilage um, notch. Um, this middle photos are one week post-op. Um, this is a number of procedures, including um, a facelift. And, and then this is, um, I believe, six months post-op. So you can kind of see still looks like the same person. I think that's really important. It's really important to a lot of these patients who go through this. A lot of people aren't trying to look extreme, you know, like patients you see on Botch or whatever, or on, you know, drag shows, or whatever. Their people just want to look natural and pass. The main thing is they don't, the terms of the terms they'll use are clocked. They're just trying to live life um, happily and safely. And safety is a really important um, part for them, um, part of the facial procedure in particular. Um, so you can see this patient um, just has softer features, looks the same, but just has um, softer features. So focusing on these procedures again, top to bottom, 
this is kind of zoomed in photo of what we just saw, um, that frontal bony bossing and then in the hairline and the brows. And so um, a lot of times we'll address, you can address all these three uh, things through one incision. Um, if patients don't need um, hairline, they can, this can be approached just through a normal um, uh, bicronal incision in the hairline. And those are, these are great patients to do that on. It's not like you're a trauma young men who you worry about balding later. This is, if they're on estrogen, they're not gonna have that problem. Um, and if, if, if you're not doing the hairline, you can still um, elevate the brow through a bicronal, just like any bicronal brow lift, but you do have to um, warn them that they ray raise the hairline doing that, depending on how much you're raising. And then if you do want to address all three, you can do it through a pretracheal approach. So when we think about forehead cranioplasty, you really want to counsel patients on, you know, you're not just going to drill down the bone. I think that used to be in the past um, and it's pretty scary because you have a lot of frontal sinus issues. Um, it's a very, you know, it's relatively thin that anterior table and you can't just drill down even if you're just trying to go down a couple millimeters. Um, so if, if you do have a pneumatized frontal sinus, you do have to do sort of like a um, osteoplastic lab kind of approach with a cranioplasty. So you actually remove um, this anterior table as one plate, um, drill down that septum, and then set it back in. And the nice thing is when you do drill and do, and then laterally you can just do uh, regular um, contouring with the drill. Um, nice thing to do is you can actually capture that um, wet bone pate and then use it around, you just put a couple small plates and use it around the edges um, and people heal really, really well from that. Um, and then again, you can, you can talk about doing a scalp advancement, you can kind of make galeotomies and rapidly um, uh, move the scalp forward. Um, these are all, you know, if we're going to do go down to the bone, this is all the way down um, below the pericranium. And then the brow left, you can approach in the same um, approach. Rhinoplasty, obviously there's lectures, courses, books about this. Um, but in general, you want to reduce the details of the nose and make the nose less noticeable. You want to go from like an Owen Wilson nose to like a little button nose that you don't notice. And some of the, you know, major things that people will come to you about, and, and, and anybody coming from rhinoplasty, this is not a transpatient, um, and just things like dorsal hump, um, again, just making it a little bit prettier, uh, narrowing with the bony vault um, as well as the tip, and then deep projection into rotations, just kind of making the nose more feminine. When you think about the in-service and all the questions they ask about um, angles and things, some are for men and for women, you just wanna, you know, obviously lean more towards the, the more feminine um, uh, angles. Um, and then cheek augmentation, I kind of referred to this before, but I think I come to touch as a good example. So um, not all high cheekbones are equal. Um, so some people will come and say like, oh, my cheekbones are so masculine. And I kind of had trouble getting my head around that in the beginning. I was like, no, you have high cheekbones, right? But it's because um, this kind of, or that malar eminence is what's um, prominent, that bony is, is really more of a masculine feature, whereas you have more of this kind of like fatty submalar fullness, uh, which is a lot of what women want, um, you know, in a, like a filler clinic, um, and that is um, much more feminine. Again, you don't want to overdo any of this, but for a lot of these patients, um, they will need a lot more of that um, a bulk in that area. And so you can do it with filler, but it's a lot. Um, it's typically achieved with cheek implants. And we almost never put a size small, um, usually like a medium or even a large, and it's usually wasn't uh, too overblown. And the nice thing about that is you can do a cheek implant, you can still do filler afterwards if, if um, you don't quite achieve that or if as they age, they need more. Um, there's multiple ways to do cheek implants um, in the literature, but in general, um, do it through an intraoral approach, um, just like you would kind of approach to the ZMC. You make a pocket um, and pop them in there. There is obviously a risk of um, infection um, that you have to counsel patients about. But then they are permanent. Again, you could remove them, um, but they're kind of a permanent result if that's what they want. And then filler on top. Um, a lip lift is a really nice procedure in these patients. This is actually something that's a very popular um, and cis women as well. Um, as women age, a lot of times t cis women tend to look more masculine. And one of the ways is because of this, um, the way the lip ages, the upper lip ages. So <clears throat> um, in upper lip aging or masculine lips, the uh, white upper lip here um, lengthens and then you lose um, bulk or um, fullness of the red lip. And so um, that's what's interesting. A lot of the kind of overdone uh, lip fillers that you'll see, you can tell someone's still old with lip filler because they may just fill the red lip 
but you still don't see their upper dentition. And that is sort of a, you, people can tell, um, and it's because sort of incongruous. Whereas uh, with a lip lift, you kind of do something like this, like a bullhorn incision, um, it reduces this um, lip here. It kind of rotates the um, red lip to look a little bit fuller. And you can also fill that at the same time, either with a dermal fat graft or just regular filler um, or fat grafting. Um, but then you end up with, um, you know, a little bit of dental show that's um, sort of prettier and younger. And in general, a lot of these procedures will, um, are sort of related to, you know, aging face and, and youthful procedures. Um, and this is something that can be done in the office, which is really nice for both, for um, any patient that's interested in it. Um, mandible contouring, again, this is another um, it's a very popular procedure um, in facial feminization. It's also a very popular procedure um, in Asia, particularly South Korea, it's called V-line surgery. Um, and again, it's kind of dependent on facial uh, patient preference and what you're starting with. So it can be both um, kind of the angles of the mandible as well as the chin, or some people just want the chin or one or the other. Um, and there's kind of, it's a bit of an art to it depending on what the patient is going for and what you can achieve. Um, typically do like an intraoral approach, sort of like you're approaching a mandible, you just wanna be really careful um, about the mental nerve. Um, and then you, um, we use like a powered rasp to sort of uh, shave down but again, this is thick bone, not like the frontal sinus. You just kind of drill it down, um, drilling down the angles and then um, narrowing the chin, making it less square or boxy. Uh, and again, more like a V. And another important part here is actually, um, we can see a little bit better here, is actually shortening the height. And that is more, um, more feminine. And in some of these patients, it may be the opposite, actually. I didn't mention it here, but sometimes... Um, you know, like anytime you're asked on the boards about rhinoplasty, you always want to comment on the lateral view about um, the chin. And so sometimes chin implants actually um, are what um, patients will need. It may be some narrowing of the lateral jaw, but then a chin implant, if they're um, particularly micronathic or retronathic, can be um, more appropriate for um, uh, balancing their face. And then um, tracheal shave, it's really sort of one of those misnomers um, that's frustrating, but it's what it's called and you just start doing it after a while. Basically, it's just reducing the Adam's apple or that prominent um, thyroid cartilage notch. Um, what's key here is um, reducing it, but then not um, damaging any um, adjacent structures. And the most important part here is um, the attachment of the anterior commissure of the vocal cords, because if you, achieve an excellent cosmetic result and then the patient's voice is like this, you've really gotten yourself in trouble and they're not gonna be very happy with you because it makes it very difficult for them to pass. Um, this is from Dr. Spiegel's papers. Um, and so this is a mark up here um, of that um, prominence. Um, but again, with anything, you don't wanna put an incision right on top because you're still gonna see a scar. You wanna hide it um, kind of in this um, crease um, as the, the neck meets the chin. Um, and that usually is plenty of room for what you need. Um, and then it's a small incision here. And then once we get down to the cartilage itself, and with younger patients, it can be very soft, and in older patients, it's more ossified. And you actually, the patient actually um, has an LMA. We put a bronch in, and then we kind of guess um, with a needle to localize where the um, anterior commissure attaches. So you can see it externally, and you get kind of in the right spot, and then you take with a rongeur, take all the cartilage above, and you can gently sort of either with a bovi or, or a drill if you want to just kind of soften those edges, but you usually don't have to, because um, there's a reasonable soft tissue envelope around it. Um, and that way you confirm that the attachment is um, intact, that you didn't involve any more of it, and you can but you can only really take out uh, what's above that. Some patients attach a little bit high, and so you're not going to take out, uh, not going to be able to take out everything. But if you counsel them on that, that you did took out as much as you could safely, then um, usually they're pretty satisfied with that. And you will have patients who um, have thin necks and will still have a prominent cricoid cartilage, and you have to really counsel them that it's good to have a thin neck, and um, cis women have that, and that's, um, and we can't take out your airway. So other procedures, we kind of referenced this before, just anything that will sort of um, give you, or so really facelift can be really useful, especially after something like uh, mandible contouring. Um, and then, you know, blepharoplasty, those kinds of things, and then really anything else um, that's considered more cosmetic, fat grafting or filler, Botox, skin resurfacing, that can be with laser peels or microneedling if the, with darker skin tones. And again, we talked about hair removal and, and hair transplantation. Um, 
to briefly touch on voice feminization, um, the goal of surgery is it's only pitch elevation. And often the patients who self-select for this are really ones who really um, kind of fought against their um, internal monologue for a long time. So they really, they tend to be the ones who became football players or in biker gangs and they've just really bulked up and they're just, they're bigger to start with and they're just kind of desperate. A lot of patients really need to start off with voice therapy and, and for most of it, because that deals with resonance and cadence and all that stuff um, is really important. All this will do is um, elevate pitch and, and some people feel like it's, it, um, temporarily. So um, the Wendler glottoplasty is, is the most common procedure done and essentially it's it's fights against everything you learn in laryngology but it's creating a web anteriorly. So you, you may see patients like this and if you do an endoscopy exam you may be like oh my gosh what happened to them but that's um, that may, you have to just you know have a thorough history that um, they did have surgery. Often these patients are pretty forthcoming. It's not like those HIV patients in clinic who are like oh any medical problems and they're like no and then you see like they're on a million medications and heart and whatever and have all these problems. Um, patients are pretty forthcoming. Um, but sometimes just finding out just if they're not, or and if you're not sure, just asking about their medications and hitting the hormone stuff will, will get you there. Um, there's a few other um, procedures that are not commonly done, and there's not really a clear consensus on, on what's right. But in general, the one that blaroplasty is what's done most frequently. So just to kind of end, um, as you go through a top-down approach, like I said, and focus on feminizing features. So a lot of people will come and they'll want to talk about their Adam's apple and their jaw. Um, but you can kind of talk, then you can kind of bring up the lip lift or cheeks or things like that. And that may be something that they've noticed, but they don't know how to um, verbalize it. And then the forehead really in studies has shown that that's really where people subconsciously look um, when they're kind of addressing um, masculinity, femininity in a face. And you really want to listen to your patient's concerns. Again, they may look like they need a this and what they want is that and you can and uh, you know listen to them first like with any cosmetic evaluation listen to them um and then and then they may ask you and oh, what else do you think and then you can bring things up but i wouldn't bring things up don't cause them more dysphoria basically with anyone don't make somebody you know the guy broke my nose and i was in middle school and i didn't think there's anything wrong with my nose and the guys you know plastic surgeon, he was like, oh, when you're older, come here, we'll do some of this, do some of that. I was like, why would you ever say that to a 12 year old? You're terrible. So I will never do that to somebody. Um, this is one of my patients, um, young patient, actually looked really good when dressed and everything, but had a few areas that we could help with. So you can kind of see from the top down, um, high hairline, bossing, kind of flat eyebrows. Um, and then we talked a little about cheeks. They're not bad, nose is not bad, but long upper lip, and then really the square chin, and then of course um, the Adam's apple. So you can kind of see that same, sort of the Norwood too, but good thick hair otherwise. Um, and again, a little bit of that bossing here, and really um, laterally you can see this here. And even here, you know, on the side, you can kind of see with the mouth open that gentle show, but still um, that upper lip was bothersome. Um, so what we ended up doing, um, at this stage, and we may do more later, was um, the forehead procedure, the full thing. So we did a pretracheal incision. Um, and this was just a month after. She's already starting, had a little bit of redness at the incision, uh, which is normal. Scalp just takes forever to heal. Um, uh, with some hair going through that incision, um, again, because we bevel and we sort of make it irregular, um, like the hairline is, um, decreasing this kind of, kind of where you can see where the light sort of hits this area, which it doesn't anymore, even though there is still swelling. Still some swelling around here, but we pulled quite a bit. And um, again, we don't want to make anyone look like Spock, but it just kind of softens. And we kind of shaved down some of the um, bone out here. And then we did just the chin. And again, she's got a ton of swelling and it really takes at least three months for that to come down. And that can be kind of the most frustrating part is you end up with a really big jaw for a little while. But for her, the key that she was so happy with initially is it's not as square, even though it's swollen, but it was a shorter. And that just kind of, she just felt like, you know, that changed the balance of her face. And she was kind of glad that we held off on the cheek implants for now because she feels like maybe she won't need them or we can always do them later. And this is sort of the scar that we end up with um, from the trach shave. That was one thing she was still a little bit upset about. She's very thin neck. Um, and she still has some, you know, this is still um, some thyroid cartilage, but we couldn't take any more. Um, so it's something that she still notices. And again, that's why we counseled well before, but she did have a very um, good result from that. And again, she's um, still healing. And you know, there's always things you can do. I think she has a pretty good nose, but there's always things you can feminize more, but you have to kind of think about like what they want and, and um, 
you know, obviously cost is a big deal as well. Uh, a lot of times it's not covered by insurance or insurance will give you the runaround, which is really frustrating. Her insurance actually tried to pit us. She was like, oh, you didn't call them or whatever. And I was like, I, I called, <laughs> you know, um, but that's just kind of the, the game they play. They didn't, they don't officially deny it, but really they do and all that stuff. Um, so that is all I have. We finished a little bit early. Um, do you all have any questions or anything? All right, well, I'll be around. Um, thank you all for listening and have a good day. I think we'll just start the next lecture um, at 10.